I think the last couple of years, the industry has seen some consolidation, right? Be it in gaming or esports and all that. So this year we thought maybe it'd be fun to kind of flip things around and say, hey, show me the money. And the burden, unfortunately, is on our very esteemed panelists to kind of like uh, talk about uh, where is the money in gaming? Where is the money in, in esports? Uh, maybe we'll touch a bit on audiences, Asia, and maybe even a little bit of of AI, right? And uh, and I want to kind of just uh, start off with, uh, I guess, on my left, Dara. Thank you for coming on this, uh, sub, I think, all-American panel, <laughs> right? Except for me. Okay, so uh, Rain Group, you've worked on billions of dollars in gaming transactions. I don't think I know anyone who's worked on more dollars in gaming transactions than, than you have. Uh, right, so tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, sure. and uh, what, what, what you've been working on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick, so much for having us on this panel. Uh, so my name is Daryl Leung. I'm a managing director at The Rain Group based in New York City. I focus now entirely on gaming, and since 2009, the founding of Rain, we've worked on over $20 billion of M&A transactions in the gaming space. Some of the more notable ones um, are the sale of Supercell to SoftBank, and then we also helped SoftBank sell its stake to Tencent. We helped Playtika exit to Giant Interactive for four and a half billion. We helped Epic Games raise over $3 billion of capital. So we've certainly seen a ton of activity over the last decade, and especially over the last three years in gaming M&A uh, consolidation and transaction. I think the difference of what we see this year relative to the last three is that there's been such a frenzy of activity from 2020 to 2022 that it has slowed down significantly. And now we're seeing a lot of the biggest players hit pause, just given how much they've paid up over the last few years and how some of that synergy isn't being realized. And that's very different, I would say, than the deals that happened before that. So like, if you look at deals that were happening in 2010 to call it 2019, those deals were priced like at a healthy rate. It was somewhere between nine to 13 times that people were paying for that. And you can realize synergies when that's the multiple that's being paid. I think over the last few years, it's been paid up so much. They're having some indigestion. So now a lot of our activity at Rain, at least on the M&A side, is focused on uh, corporate carve out. So indigestion from earlier deals and seeing that spin out. Um, but I would say where we still see the money is uh, just flight to quality. So the best entrepreneurs, the best companies with the highest growth, the most proven guys with the highest KPIs are definitely getting capital. Uh, we're investors ourselves as well. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there um, and let the rest of the group go, but that's where we're spending a lot of time is on the highest growth companies. We'll give uh, Mike and Kuhn a bit of chance to to, to talk about, uh, but you know, 20 billion in transactions, hitting pause, indigestion, and then kind of like, uh, there's still a lot of money in quality. We'll come back to that in a bit. So Mike Putaseri, right, uh, Ben Pixels, not a stranger to this this stage, this panel. Welcome back. And uh, Thank you. you've been working, you know, actually, I'm, I, I, I want to say, I can't think of anyone who's made more money for esports teams than perhaps you have, right? AT teams around the world, some of the top big names from uh, uh, what, uh, uh, FaZe Clan to Team Liquid and all that. You've helped them to make so much money. What are you working on right now? Yeah, no, uh, again, thanks for having me. Appreciate it, love Singapore and uh, being on stage with you, Nick, the illustrious Nick. Um, yeah, we, we've been, you know, this has been a very challenging time. Our, our business is focused on primarily monetizing content around audience on YouTube. So we, we provide layers of monetization for the content creators we work with, including the teams. And, and that's been a big challenge these, I think the last 12 months, primarily because the brands and media agencies we work with um, aren't seeing the return, I think, that they expected from some of the campaigns that they've, that they've actually run. And I think that that really, is you know that's a difficult situation right when when you're trying to generate real revenue for these teams um at the end of the day you know and i, th I think there's been a a focus around the team you know a lot of the teams have been owned by traditional um sports ownership 
And that traditional media mindset is very different from a team, uh, an esport team mindset in terms of generating revenue, growth. You know, an esport team in an org, um, that's a media property. Those players create content. That content generates revenue, recurring revenue. And that recurring revenue is super valuable. And the, and the individual um, teams that we work with that have gotten away from that have had some very challenging, you know, scenarios transpire, a lot of which are in the public, public eye. And we do our best to try to get them back on track, get them back focusing on audience, creating content that is going to drive more recurring revenue, and then getting those advertising access to, the, to that audience. Because that's really what the audience wants, right? That elusive young male audience. And that's the beauty of esports and gaming specifically. Look, gaming, right? You're talking about 300 billion views just on YouTube. I talk about YouTube because at the end of the day, when you look at the amount of money that's being spent within gaming, it's on YouTube. Two thirds of the revenue associated with any spend in terms of advertising, advertising dollars is on YouTube. So we're focused on YouTube because of that. So I think at you know, we hope that there's an opportunity to be able to turn the corner in terms of getting teams more focused on really having as many of their players create content that they can, having a lineup of creators that are, you know, that, that are really focused on less about winning. Winning is an important part of a team, but there's also has, has to be a, a media property mindset within, within each team to, to actually win going forward in our, in our, you know, from our standpoint. Thank you, Mike. Teams as media properties, 300 billion views on YouTube alone and, and getting back to real revenues. So we'll dig a bit into that. Hopefully we have enough time to cover. There's a lot of things we need to cover today. And uh, Kun, right? Um, okay, I've got to try to give this a step. Uh, I can't think of anyone who's brought more uh, anime to more people in the world than you have in Crunchyroll. And then now you are trying to make a huge uh, impact and contribution on, on gaming. I think you're working on stuff like toxicity and all of that. Tell us a bit about uh, what GGWP is, what you've been working on. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. So I think in the description of this panel, uh, it was something like veterans and newcomers. I I'm definitely the newcomer in this in this space. Uh, my background is uh, originally in engineering. Uh, ended up uh, being a serial entrepreneur. Uh, founded a um, a social media company, and then ended up uh, founding Crunchyroll. Uh, and after my uh, Crunchyroll journey. Uh, which was at the end of 2019. Uh, I was making bold plans for 2020, a lot of travel, which didn't happen, but uh, uh, ended up getting stuck at home uh, with uh, friends. And uh, we just all played a lot of games together. And uh, we realized that gaming was ju you know, just as toxic as we remember when we were in college playing. And we said, okay, well, let's, you know, let's try to do something about it. And so that's where uh, GGWP came from. Uh, it stands for good game, well played. It's something you type at the end of your gaming session. Uh, and uh, we're using AI to uh, help create more positive uh, communities uh, in, in, in gaming. Um, my uh, experience and my perspective is really one from the operator's uh, perspective. Um, and I, I've just learned so much in the last uh, uh, two years or so being in the gaming space. Um, I, I realize that the macro is you know, not not super rosy at the moment, uh, but I, I do think that this is uh, a, a, as good a time as any if you are going to be a founder to build in this space. Um, and I, I think that now we actually have uh, gaming-focused VCs, a number of gaming-focused VCs, which we just never didn't have five years ago, and uh, so many startups that were funded in the last you know three to five years focusing in this space. And uh, I, I th I'm just really excited to uh, be a participant in that. Yeah, time to build. Um, you know, we talked about toxicity. We talked about uh, being a come kind of a bit of winter in esports, indigestion in gaming, all doom and gloom and all that. But surely there are some bright spots in the space, right? What are some of the bright spots or the high growth areas you're seeing in gaming and esports right now, Dara? Thank you, and that's actually perfect because I just want to piggyback off what Kuhn said, which is there are more VCs in gaming than ever before. Since 2021, there's been $3 billion of capital raised for specific gaming funds. 
And this doesn't include all the funds like the traditional private equity or growth equity guys that have started paying attention to gaming like they never have before. So in many ways, although we've seen like a ton of growth in gaming, it's the biggest, you know, one of the biggest sectors in entertainment, it's one of the highest growth sectors, it's reaching a point of maturity because of what happened in 2020. The reality is it's still a very immature industry when you think about capital invested, professionalized, uh, institutions looking at gaming. So there is a lot of capital out there and they're going to quality companies like the one Kuhn's creating. They're going to other quality companies that have now have individuals spinning out of the big corporates. And historically there hasn't been that sort of capital base that has supported these guys. And we're two to three years out now from some of the initial seed investments and we're seeing like phenomenal results, right? So uh, Dream Games, which I'm sure probably gets a lot of attention at conferences like these, they were seeded back in 2019. They didn't start building their game to 2020. It has now surpassed Candy Crush as the biggest mobile game of all time, and they're working on their second title. Um, and this was from a $10 million seed check. But back in the day, $10 million seed check in gaming was completely unheard of. But we're starting to see that, and we're starting to see the results of that. Another example on the more core side is um, Netty's investment into Second Dinner. Um, X Hearthstone guys, that game just launched Marvel Snap at the end of last year. Again, most successful mobile Marvel game in history. And then finally, we're starting to see AAA PC console game launches. Um, a lot of these guys have spun out of Blizzard, out of Riot, now starting to spin out of Epic. And one of the first launches just happened August 10th. So we have less than one month of data, but it's phenomenal. It's Singularity 6's Palea. Um, and it's proving out a lot of the theses that entrepreneurs wanted to have while there are gaming companies, bigger ones, um, but previously didn't have capital. So there's, there's capital going into these companies, there's capital going into these founders, and the results are remarkable. And, and this is just the beginning, right? This is like the first time we've seen really institutional capital going into gaming like this. And I think there's a lot more to come. I think potentially some things aren't gonna work, but this is early stages of early stage investing. Like a, a lot of them aren't going to work, but for the first time, there's capital to support the ones that that will. When, when Dara says that uh, you know you've you've done more than ten billions of transactions and you say it's still 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 uh, early, still uh, growing and professionalizing, that gives me a lot of hope, right? That <laughs> there's a lot more. Uh, I don't know, uh, Mike, from where you're sitting, right? Um, what what are some of the bright spots, right? Some surely some of this growth or this this uh, bright spots in the gaming sector would uh, come into esports or, or into YouTube as well. Yeah, I mean, for us, the the perspective is is around the audience and the growth there. I think that we're you know the, the spike that occurred during the pandemic was significant, and that that drew, drove a lot of revenue um, a, a, across the industry. Even since then, there's been a thirty percent compound annual, annual growth growth rate, which I think is amazing around gaming. Gaming is. Um, is is on a high growth trajectory across the globe i think what's interesting and why we love our partners here with hep mill and spending a lot of time across asia and building a real business here is the you know when you look at that that 300 that 300 billion in views over 55 percent of it is across asia specifically southeast asia so you know you know i've heard some panels talk about the opportunity across southeast asia it's enormous from an audience growth standpoint, and um, you know, we're excited about that. We're we're excited about our teams, our creator partners being able to lean into that. But more importantly, kind of advocating across the brands that we work with that there's real opportunity here. There's global opportunity. It's not just in North America. It's 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 primarily in Asia. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Kun. Right. So um, two weeks ago, I was in Riyadh. Uh, it's my first time there. Uh, never been. I think and we, we, we we crossed each other like maybe on the flights. Nice. Right? <laughs> okay. And I was just amazed by what by what I saw. Uh, they were uh, uh, the Saudi government's basically investing like what forty billion into gaming and esports in the next seven or eight years. Uh, they're building out like uh, a lot of infrastructure. They're trying to build out the entire uh, Middle East region. There's hundreds of millions of audience there and. You know, it's it's really hot out there. So, like, what what else can you do? Well, you know, play games. Uh, that's going to be uh, a huge area of growth for them, especially right now when uh, you know there's not a lot of capital to be had in uh, the traditional uh, um, uh, um, 
avenues of that. Uh, and so I'm super excited by just that development in and of itself and continue to fuel uh, entrepreneurs uh, and, and, and just the growth of gaming in, uh, in Middle East as well as in, uh, so in Southeast Asia. Uh, one of the um, uh, companies I angeled in, Ekaterina, uh, they're engaging in at the college level. Uh, <laughs> There he is. Uh, they're uh, they're 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 really uh, uh, yeah, deeply wo woven into uh, the college and 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 the uh, entre uh, and the scene for young young uh, adults to engage in gaming as really a part of their lifestyle. And they just had like a, a huge convention that had uh, like thirty forty thousand people show up. It's like their first year. Right. I'm going to stay with uh, Kun for, for for a minute there. And you know, like uh, you were in Riyadh and. We had actually his Royal Highness uh, Faisal Bender who was here last year and he was talking about his, uh, his billions of dollars of budgets to contribute, to have gaming and esports contribute like I think 1% of GDP in, in, in Saudi, right? That was, that was his, his plan and we're now seeing that play out and seeing it in the, in the flesh in Riyadh is pretty incredible, right? Um, but yourself, you've invested in content in, in, in media and now you're looking at gaming and esports and all that. I, I want to hear your thoughts on AI, right? Just, just kind of like uh, you've, you've, have you been looking at the area and how that plays in, in gaming and esports? Yeah, so we were uh, pretty early in AI when we started the company. Uh, our company is uh, basically using AI and built from the ground up to detect when uh, there's toxicity or positive behavior uh, in games and to uh, reward players for being positive. Uh, and what we've seen in, in terms of the, the new generation of AI technology that's coming into the space, I think is quite remarkable. Uh, I think it is uh, using AI to create content, to create assets, to create characters, to create experiences. And all of this is going to be able to allow um, uh, much smaller teams to be much more nimble, to be able to create content and create games uh, in a much faster pace. Uh, if you think about traditional game development, you're talking about like three years to five years plus in, in terms of bringing something to market. Uh, and a lot of that is just uh, starting from the ground up where you're, you're, you know, I don't know, taking six months to just think about concept art or mood boards. And all that, you know, weeks of iteration can, can now be collapsed into like 15 minutes of using generative AI tools. So I, I'm extremely bullish about the use of AI to be able to empower a uh, new generation of creators uh, and, and developers to bring more content and, and more games uh, to the audience much more quickly. And, and maybe I'll skip over here to, to Dara, right? So you've been talking about the, the consolidation, the carve outs and all that, but surely you're also looking at some of these new growth areas in, in AI as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think where we might differ from, now I'm putting on the Rain investor hat, where we might differ from some other investors on this is we've had a ton of experiences on the tech and tool side from our M&A business. We helped sell Weta for a billion eight to Unity. You know, a lot of the Epic Games capital raising that we did was centered around the value of the Unreal Engine. So we have a first row view of the power of tech and tools in gaming, media, and entertainment. I think the reality of it is though, it's, it's extraordinarily hard to monetize AI or tech and tools in and of itself. It's just a capped TAM based on how much you can really charge. But that's a different conversation than how much it can accelerate development, which is I think the point that Kuhn's getting to, is that it just really, really drives, like turbocharges what people can do with a small team and small budget. And there lies the value of bringing something to market much faster, of potentially segmenting the audience so that you can create something for everyone in a way that has never been possible because you just didn't have enough developers to do that. And then the consumers, the end consumers of the game or the media and entertainment um, product gets the benefit of it. So that's probably where we're spending more time. Um, rather than looking directly at like AI tech and tools, we are working with a lot of studios which are using it in-house. A lot of our portfolio companies are using it in-house and it's, it's astonishing what it could do um, and how much it's it's turbocharging the pace of development. Okay, we were being a bit naughty on the, the title of the panel there, show me the money, right? It's not always about the, the money, right? It's uh, about the acceleration. I think, Mike, you talked about actually the audience is growing 30%, right? Even though the, the money may not be catching up, but that, that, uh, that lag, I think, creates a lot of opportunity. And 
you know, when you were here last year, we had uh, someone else on stage, right? It was uh, it was Face Clan, right? And uh, they they've um, unfortunately couldn't join us this time, and and I think we've seen that they've struggled a little bit and all that. So I don't know what's your thoughts on, that, but they seem to have reached to a massive audience, which you, you've also been helping them on. Yeah, I know. We're look, we're we're a close partner with Phase, and and uh, they have an in, an enormously large audience, and I think that is where the opportunity lies to turn to turn that around to turn that business around and it's it's a unique challenge because you've got you know original the ogs of phase that um you know are, are look they're disenfranchised with with how the business has been run and um you know and uh not to be too controversial but you know it's been botched and at the end of the day, they need to get the, the the current ownership needs to start allowing those OGs to continue and to get back on track and creating content. And if they if they do, they'll be able to turn it around, and you'll see like a what you know what I would consider a you know a, a Michael Jordan game seven three point turnaround. The the industry needs it, to be honest, because uh, the industry does not need uh, a, a massive public failure like that that's potentially coming. Because that is coming unless some changes are made, and so we we certainly don't want to see that. Um, and you know we're going to play our part, but I think that there is a there's a unique opportunity to 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 make that uh, you know a Cinderella story. Thank you, and I, I'm kind of watching the clock here a little bit, and what else kind of like we do have time to cover. But uh, I feel that uh, Kun, you have something to add in terms of because you work with so many audiences, you're trying to work on new solutions in this in the gaming space, and you worked with a lot of audiences in the past. Where uh, what kind of like what are your insights, right, in in terms of uh, well, as far as audiences and monetization is concerned? Yeah, I think the. Um the, the big picture question for me is uh, what is the next big platform that's going to enable uh, enable new new business models, new use cases that we just can't imagine that's going to be you know a trillion dollar uh, um, a market size, right? So if you think about the platforms that have come before or up, uh, up to now, uh, I'm going to you know, probably skip a few, but like there's consoles, there's PC, there's internet, there's mobile, uh, there's um, transactional, subscription, free to play. And anytime you have a, uh, a platform along with a business model, I think that uh, creates you know, huge opportunities in terms of how you uh, create new games or new content, how you package that, how do you monetize that, and how do you reach audience. And, and I think that's kind of like what I feel like gaming is uh, continuing to to look for what is that next huge uh, platform uh, it sounds like you know the jury's still out on whether it's you know AR VR uh, is AI going to be a platform or is it just going to be part of the the, the, the tool set um, and uh, I think a lot of the investments in the last uh, three years in gaming has uh, at least at the at the early seed stage has all been in uh, you know game studios and and, and blockchain um, I feel like every uh, game develop uh, game studio if you spun out and you're looking for investment uh, if you you know raise money in the last like you know, two, three years, you want to put blockchain on there because that gets you like double the valuation for, for, for basically no work. Um, but I'm bullish on the, uh, the prospect of someone figuring out what is the right business model to build on blockchain that enables uh, gaming to take that next step as a business model. Uh, because uh, up to now, it's always been, uh, here's you know, the people who create the game experience and the content, and on the other side is the consumer. Uh, blockchain enables uh, more participants uh, and the prospect of true asset ownership of what you, know, of what you own inside a game. So I I'm super excited by uh, uh, folks still uh, try uh, trying to figure that out. Well, hearing you, I, I kind of beginning to. I've not, I've not, I've not seen or used the the platform. I but I kind of get a sense where you're taking it, and I'm I'm going to start following, <laughs> following you, and and the work you're you're doing. And and I, I think Dara, you you've kind of like besides the gaming and esports, right? You've also obviously been tracking what the the large media companies, your Disney's of the world, have been have been doing in in the streaming space and all that. So, Kun's working on like looking at working on new platforms and all that. So what do you think? Yeah, so I think um, if you, there, I think there's two things. I think one thing if I can piggyback off kind of Kun sure. saying is where there's areas of growth and I think it's already happening is on the Roblox, Minecraft and Fortnite platform. So like UGC 
gaming is a new uh, area of like hyper growth and profitability. We're seeing game studios on the Roblox platform make north of like $50 million of EBITDA and at its peak, 100 million. These are numbers that we don't really see, except for in the first few years of like a mobile game studio back in 2009, when there was like no competition in the space to get to that level of profitability that quickly. So I think that is an area to continue to watch and it's still very, very nascent. There's not a lot of, there's no professionalization actually of any of those studios. They're all 19 year olds who are building on these games because they've grown up playing them. So I think that's the platform area of growth. On, on what you're saying, Kuhn, on entertainment companies, Disney, Fox, you know, Comcast, Liberty Global in the UK, I think the there's there's always been talks about like what's 360 monetization look like? Let's take a game property and make it into a movie and a story and a comic and a TV series. Um, but over the last, I would say, 10 years, instead what you've really seen are the big media companies spinning out their game studios. You saw that with Fox Next. After the Disney Fox merger, they spun out um, Fox Next that Scopely ended up acquiring. Um, but I think what's different now about a lot of these big media players is that they're reaching a saturation point in their streaming business. So a lot of them have been focused on direct-to-consumer. They've been focused on creating their own streaming platform. They've all launched them now. And the reality is they're not seeing the same level of profitability from those streaming platforms that they have earlier had on linear TV. So if they're gonna remain a big entertainment competitor, they have to go to where the eyeballs are and the eyeballs are simply in gaming. So they're starting to look at gaming companies in transformational ways. It's no longer like, let's buy a small mobile gaming studio and give them all of our Marvel license, right? Like that strategy doesn't work. It just makes it too non-core of the business. They're now looking at transformational deals that might really change the narrative of what they are as an entertainment company. So that's an area where just given the rain background of starting as you know really a media and entertainment bank, uh, where we're starting to see potentially major deals happen in the future. I mean, what you described is really interesting, right? How these large media companies are looking at gaming in very, very different lenses and uh, It'd be interesting as far as business where the, the new opportunities that would create. But going back to your earlier point about 360 monetization, right? Uh, Mike, I know we talked about, about eSports team and all that, but surely with the YouTube and I'm sure you're looking into other platforms and you know we talked about monetization and, and Roblox and all that, that you've been also been looking at a, a more holistic 360 type of model for, for what you're working on. Yeah, and I double down on the UGC gaming. I think that's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for the platforms. It's a huge opportunity for creators as well. So that's that's been that's been very exciting. I think you know from from a standpoint of you know we've been doing this 15 years. We're very pragmatic. Um, you know we built the business from the ground up. You know profitably. We've done that because we focus on how are we going to drive the most value for the creator? And I think from a creator standpoint, it's multi-layered monetization, specifically on YouTube, but other platforms, right? And, and what does that even mean? So you've got to have, you've got to have AdSense or the algorithm driven revenue. You've got to have branded content coming your way. You've got to be focused on potentially putting together products that align with your either content, which you've seen, obviously everybody's seen Mr. Beast is leading the, the forefront of that. Um, you know, from that standpoint, there's a ton of opportunity there for some of the larger creators. And um, look, there's also premium media, which no one ever talks about. Everybody talks about media in the traditional media standpoint. But we don't talk about premium media as it relates to specifically YouTube. So the ability to be able to target brands and media agencies being able to target specifically individual creators or groups of creators, right? If you want to target just Fortnite creators, you have the ability to do that. A lot of brands and media agencies don't, do, don't understand that. We've been spending about three and a half, four years educating the brands and media agencies about that. They understand they could do that from a music standpoint. They've been doing it with Vivo for a long time, but that's an important, that's 300% more revenue for a creator without any additional work. So we've launched that here in Asia, uh, across APAC or Southeast Asia, and that's been, you know, it's an education process. It's been hard because the brands don't, un don't even really understand that they can do it. It's premium, so they have to spend a little bit more, but ultimately the results are there. It's, it's like 10 times more effective of a campaign. And so we want to continue to drive what really matters for the creators, driving more m revenue layered monetization. We're also launching financial services because some of the smaller creators on the spectrum don't have the capital. So we're leaning into that as well. I think that kind of holistic view of what is going to drive viewership, audience, right? 
in monetization for the creator. Um, that I think is is an opportunity for us as a business and the industry to be able to kind of incorporate some of these things that are going on outside of gaming inside of gaming. Well, it looks like we are at the top of our half hour, right? Um, I've, we've definitely started by putting everyone on a bit of a back foot, talking about sh showing the money, but obviously there's so much more uh, behind that, right? And, and be besides the money, I really kind of like, I don't know about you, but uh, this feels like a, a, a pretty uh, serious, but uh, you know, a very, very uh, uh, educational session about the, um, where the growth, the bright spots are in, in gaming, esports, in audiences, uh, in, in in platforms and and potentially the transformational uh, aspects of where gaming is going with the inputs of the, the different stakeholders and the large media companies and all that. So with that, if you can join me to thank Dara, Mike, and Kuhn for this very, very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick.